you know, the whole designer baby um, thinking is alive and well. I have the money to buy and the technology will allow me to do this. Our children are now products. We just, we just say, well, doctor, take that one away or get rid of that one. Because, you know, my husband and I have two little girls and we really just wanted a boy. Um, and so we don't want another little girl. Jennifer, thanks for sitting down with me. Oh, I, I'm so excited. I love sitting with a fellow Californian. So you have been a nurse, but right now and for, I think, over two decades, you've led the Center for Bioethics and Culture, and you've been doing some incredible work, 12 documentary films, uh, advocating for the protection of both children and women and the bonds that they have with each other, mothers and children. Tell me about how you got into that and how that all started for you. Yeah, well, I, I was a pediatric critical care nurse for a long time. I worked at UC San Francisco, UCLA, Children's Hospital in Oakland. So I was always a strong advocate for, for children and children's health. I was a little bit, um, how should I say it politely, uh, undone by this shifts I saw in medicine um, in, the, in the space of medical ethics. And when you're working with, you know, premature infants and in and, and academic hospitals, you're working with children that have really, you know, horrible diagnoses, um, you know, you're always pushing the envelope. I worked with the doctor in San Francisco that did the first surgery where they actually took the baby out of the womb, repaired the defect and put the baby back in the womb so that the baby could be born healthy. So I, I love science, I love technology, but I really, you know, I love the saying, just because we can, should we? And so I went back to graduate school and studied bioethics, which is sort of a deep dive into, you know, new emerging technologies, um, the ethics around it. Why do we do things? Why don't we do things? What are the principles that should govern nursing and medicine and how we practice? And then when I was in graduate school, I kind of got the bug to not go back into nursing. And at that point, I founded the Center for Bioethics and Culture as an educational um, resource because I thought, there's so much coming. Um, when I graduated from graduate school, Dolly the sheep had just been cloned. And we had the huge debate around um, cloning and cloning human beings. Uh, there was a great essay in Wired magazine called Why the Future Doesn't Need Us Anymore. It was really raising the alarms on artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, robotics, cybernetics, what happens when you can start integrating machines into our bodies. And I just thought, whoa, these are things everybody up until that point was talking about abortion, euthanasia, um, you know, maybe issues around kidney transplantation, should we buy and sell organs? And, and I thought there's so much coming and we wanted to be sort of a, 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 a means of informing the public because we all have a stake in how doctors treat us. Um, and so at that point, George Bush was president and we have this huge debate around embryonic stem cell research and human cloning, and we have to have cures because people are dying. We have to you know, solve cures. And the way that we're gonna solve cures is through this new research. And it was that point in time when the CBC was born. And I was one of a handful of people saying, where are the eggs gonna come from? Um, and how do we get to the point in the United States when Bush was president, we had a half a million frozen human embryos. Now in the U.S. we have well over a million, and you know how did we get to to this point? And you know it was in that that spirit of that that time in history when I really sort of got consumed in assisted reproductive technologies. The line that divide your first documentary film created through CBC your organization was that around the time of the three billion dollars that California was giving taxpayer dollars that California was giving to the experimentation of embryos for the sake of cures. And there was a whole debate about how if you don't support this experimentation of embryos, then you don't support cures for terrible diseases that many are suffering. They had, you know, Michael J. Fox and other famous actors who are just suffering these terrible conditions, saying we need this money to be spent on embryonic stem cell research. Yeah, it was at that time. And I was and still am based in California. So I was very involved in that whole Prop 71 was the, the initiative where California voters you know, went to the ballots and, and, and voted to give $3 billion to, and I think the slogan then was cures for California. And of course, they always like to put you on the side of being anti-cure. You want people to die, you want people to be sick. No, I was a nurse for 
many, many years. I'm, I'm very interested in people, you know, being made well. Um, and it was in that time that, that we got the idea to produce a documentary film, again, to try to educate people, educate voters, you know, that, that, that this is a, you're being sold, you know, snake oil. Um, and as far as I know, we burned through all of that money and then some, and, you know, we're still not curing people in California. I, I find that so, tr not just tragic, but it, I, I, as a, from the pro-life position, these are human beings. You know, some of these were existing embryos that were in deep freeze that are then going to be used for experimentation, have been used. But as you're going to talk about soon here, some of these embryos are newly created lives through egg donation and sperm donation. And despite the $3 billion, there's no cures, but there are advancements being made uh, medically using adult stem cells. So even if there were advancements being made using the bodies of little babies that are living that need to be killed for the research, it would make it wrong. But the fact that they're not even, those cures are not even being found just shows that the whole thing was a scam. Yeah, and if we were going to um, advance the trajectory that the scientists wanted to go on, which was um, you know, without any restrictions on embryonic stem cell uh, research, you know, we knew the scale of that project. Um, we knew that, you know, the half a million embryos that were frozen, whether they were discarded, abandoned, you know, left to, to you know, be destroyed or whatever, that was not going to satisfy the supply because every single bench researcher is going to have to have their own access to stem cell lines because they're doing research on diabetes or breast cancer or, you know, name the millions of diseases that, that scientists try to study and then to develop cures. Um, we at the time in California, uh, me, we being a handful of other women kind of activist groups, um, advocacy groups, were able to at least say in Prop 71 when that bond initiative passed, none of the money could be used to pay women for, egg, for their eggs. Because we knew then that, that right now people who want to buy eggs for making babies, they want Stanford, you know, NYU, um, you know, Ivy League eggs. But if you're a bench researcher, you don't care if this is a low-income woman of color who's uneducated. And we just knew that this, this campaign um, to cure California was going to really target heavily impoverished women. And so that was a little um, victory, small, in, in having to sw you know, swallow that bitter pill that Prop 71 passed. But of course, now that Newsom's um, in charge, that's gone away. And, and now in California, you can pay women for eggs to make babies, or you can pay women for eggs because you need them for your research. One of your next films was Exploitation, which I think was when I first met you. We were talking earlier about when we first met well over a decade ago. I may have been in college or recently graduated, and you were screening the film in, was it Livermore? Yeah, Livermore. There's a nice little independent movie theater down there that we love to use. Um, it's always been very friendly to our content, which, you know, just when you do controversial work, there's a lot of people that don't want to invite you and let you use their facilities. So the Vine has always been very hospitable to us. Um, and yeah, we, when, when I was fighting Prop 71 and re we, re we launched a hands off our ovaries campaign, you know, um, just kind of, you know, trying to be catchy and get people's attention. I had women who had sold their eggs during college reach out to me and say, let me tell you what happened to me. Um, and, and, you know, that's the litany of short and long-term medical complications that they had and the way that they were just discarded and treated so poorly. And I remember being on a plane to go to Kansas and I was bringing with me a young egg donor who at the time was living in San Francisco, but she was a PhD student in Kansas. And Kansas was looking at a piece of legislation that would um, be around embryonic stem cell research and the need for eggs. And so I was asked to come and testify at that hearing. And I said, can I bring um, Alexandra? Um, because maybe they'll listen to her. She was a student in the state. And so we went and testified. Um, it fell on deaf ears. It was like, oh, that's so bad that that happened to you. But, you know, most of the time that doesn't happen. You know, we're still going to move forward. And we, you know, got on our little... Southwest Air flight back from Kansas, back into San Francisco. And I remember looking at her and saying, let's make a movie. Would you be willing to be in a movie if I made a movie? And she said, yeah, I would do that. And then I knew Kala uh, Papademus, who was a student at Stanford who suffered, suffered a massive stroke. 
trying to donate her eggs. I'd already met a young uh, medical student. She was uh, doing an MD, PhD at University of California, Irvine. I reached out to her and I said, Cindy, would you be in the film? And I had these three women that said, yeah. We made the film in a weekend. We did two days on location at UC Berkeley in, in Berkeley, California, and, and another uh, location. And then we did interviews down in Southern California. And within four weeks, we won Best Documentary um, on that film in the California Independent Film Festival. Everybody who'd worked on the movie, I kept passing them the, the email around. I said, I think it says we won. Because <laughs> that was a shock. I mean, we never made a movie before. We never made a movie in four weeks. Um, it was so low budget. Um, and then we actually, several years later, we updated and expanded that film because when that first version of exploitation came out, more women came out. And, and since then, uh, two of my colleagues and I have gotten published in the medical literature, a case study of five otherwise healthy young women who sold their eggs and then went on as young women to get breast cancer. Let's talk through that because for folks who are listening and they you know, maybe have heard of surrogacy or IVF, or maybe they've even been involved with IVF, uh, you know, but maybe egg donation they're not as familiar with or they're wanting to learn more. Can you break down the steps that take place for egg donation from the marketing of it or the advertising of it to potential uh, women who will be the donors all the way to how these eggs are used? Um, and, you know, part of this is obviously these women that are speaking out that you're sharing their stories or a platform to share these stories. You don't hear these stories <laughs> otherwise. And that's one of the reasons it's so important for you and your work to be widely spread. Most people, if they think about egg donation, they might see an ad on their Facebook feed. I know in college, there was a girlfriend of mine from high school who sent me a note saying, hey, I, I'm thinking about donating my eggs. I can make a few thousand dollars. What do you think? And sent me the ad. And I didn't have all the um, formation that I have now to understand all the ethical, all the reasons, ethically speaking, why this was wrong. But I knew enough to say, this is part of your, 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 your potential future child and to sell it, you know, to donate it for money selling. Uh, you know, what about these, this child that might be uh, in the world somewhere you don't know what's going to happen? And then, you know, what are the risks? What are the risks to you? So walk us through all of that. You know, the marketing is very slick. Um, when two of my daughters were students at the University of California, Berkeley, their school paper had an ad, you know, $100,000 for an elite donor. So it's very eugenic. It's um, very selective. You know, it, it's all flowery, make dreams come true, help a family. Um, you'll, you'll see young girls who have sold their eggs saying, well, you know, you have so many eggs. I'm not using them anyway. Uh, and so there's this lore and, and people go, well, I like to help people. And you know, sure, that money sounds great, and I'm not using my eggs right now. Why not sell some? Um, but, you know, there is the drugs. Uh, you know, women immediately take, um, uh, after they're screened, first they have to be screened, right? You know, back to my point about breast cancer. If you check that you have a history of breast cancer, you can trust me, you're not selected because nobody wants to buy the eggs of a woman who has a history of breast cancer. What if you have a little girl child? Um, so, you know, there's a, a rigorous, you know, selection process, making sure that you're going to provide good genetic material. But that's self-reported. Self-reported, self-reported. Um, and then, you know, the women, once they're selected, they're put on drugs. First, they're put on, oftentimes they're put on Lupron, which is the drug that we use in puberty blocker in the trans debate. Um, uh, it's what's used in, you know, incarcerated men, pedophiles, you know, rapists, because it makes you impotent. It makes you... Um, not sexually uh, curious. Um, so they're put on Lupron and, and it's because it's very, it's a very controlled um, process. They want to suppress the woman's normal ovarian uh, function because they're trying to time when the eggs come out of her body that they can make the embryos and transfer them, say, into a woman's body that's going to be carrying the child using the donor egg. So there's this process of first stopping her ovarian function by using lap Lupron. Lupron has a category X rating, and uh, the FDA gives different ratings of drugs, oftentimes based on if they're carcinogenic or if they will cause, um, you know, birth defects in the unborn child. So here you're taking women on college campuses who might be sexually, sexually promiscuous, sexually active, not follow the instructions, um, and, and, you know, put them on a category X rated drug. Then once the, um, the timing is all orchestrated, and she might stay on Lupron a couple of weeks, it really depends. Um, on, on monitoring her, her hormones, 
Then she's put on fertility drugs, which really ramp up the production of eggs. Because if you're paying a woman $50,000, $100,000, $10,000, you don't want one egg, which is what we normally ovulate. You want as many as you can get. And so uh, you'll see in their chat rooms, you'll see them talking about how their ovaries get this big. They feel them sloshing in their belly. They feel like they're pregnant. They can't, you know, button their clothes. And then the woman takes one final shot when the eggs look like they're mature. It's called a trigger shot. It's HCG. And that releases the eggs from their little follicles so that when they go up, usually transvaginally with a long catheter with a needle, they puncture each one of these little, think of like little grapes, and they puncture each one and they suck out the egg. So if you have, you know, Cindy in the film produced 60 eggs, six zero. So six, 60 times they had to make a puncture um, about to take out, you know, the eggs. So she immediately had an artery in it. And because she was a medical student, she knew something was wrong. But they're like, no, no, this is normal. She goes, I can't stand up. I have so much pain. She was in recovery for about, I think, six hours when they finally took her and had an ultrasound. And she was just full of blood because she'd been slowly bleeding. But Alexandra, the woman in Kansas, she had a, she had a torsioned ovary, uh, torsion fallopian tube, because she was so um, edematous. It's called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome that her fallopian tube actually kinked like a garden hose. And she was, you know, in Kansas, a PhD student, didn't have a car. She was back at home. She has to find a friend that can take her to the clinic because she's in so much pain. She's so um, distended. And her friend took her. They said, you're fine. This is normal drink. Gatorade. They're trying to, you know, get that fluid to come down. She came back a third, a second time. Again, had to find another friend. No, no, you're fine. The third time she went back, um, she finally saw the fertility doctor who'd actually done her retrieval. And she said his face went white. I mean, they rushed her into the operating room and sure enough, she lost her ovary because it had, had not been hitting a blood supply for days because of this kink. Um, and then she was the one that several years later, about three or four years later, was diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer. So there's all these short and these long-term risks. And when these women have problems, it's, you know, Kala at Stanford who had a stroke, well, it's your fault because you didn't tell us you had an undiagnosed pituitary tumor on your pituitary gland. She didn't know she had one. And, it, you know, it's very common. And a lot of people have them and they don't know they have, have them. Um, so they, you know, blamed it on her. And so it's, um, and you're right, they're selling their children. You know, th at the end of the day, they're selling their children. And two of the women in exploitation lost their ability to ever have their own children. So their fertility was permanently damaged. Um, one of the women had, not had to, she chose to use assisted reproduction because she was struggling because her fertility was damaged. And so in order to conceive, she went to the fertility doctor to help her. So it's just, it's just, it's just a racket. Big fertility made a lifelong client. Yeah. Um, so in the case of Alexandra, you mentioned, you know, one of, one of the later uh, consequences she endured was breast cancer. Is there, is there research connecting the de developing breast cancer after egg donation? Well, the dirty little secret is that we have never studied um, egg donors. I mean, egg donors are not patients, they're healthy. You know, we do have in the medical literature women who have underlying issues with fertility. And there is stuff in the medical literature about women who take a lot of fertility drugs for their own trying to conceive using their own bodies, their own eggs, and, and a link to breast cancer. But when, you, when you've never studied um, a patient population, and again, I use patient loosely because they're not sick. There's no reason for them to do this. You know, when you think about doctors putting you on medication, it's used because you're sick and you need this medication. These women take high dose, high powerful you know, dose in short bursts. And, you know, I know egg donors who have done it, you know, many times. Julia Derrick's written a book called The Confessions of a Serial Egg Donor, and I believe she did it 10 times. But there's no data. And we don't follow all the women I've mentioned in the films and the others that I know that aren't in my films. There's no data. They're not in a database like an organ donor. You, If you donate your kidney, you live the rest of your life in a database. So we know Lila Rose gave her organ and Lila Rose gave her organ to this guy. And that guy's in the database and we can track these people. And we don't do that. They're called egg donors, but they're making money, <laughs> yeah. you know, money up to, you mentioned $100,000 if you're in the elite specimen, which again, I mean, you talk about eugenics. Um, what are the, 
what are the laws that govern selling, literally selling your eggs? My understanding is you're not allowed to sell organs or eggs. They have to be donated. How does the money changing hands happen legally? Well, legally, it's a sort of, um, you know, the disingenuous language. She's being compensated for her time. The eggs are free. She's giving the eggs away for free. We're not buying the eggs. We're buying her time. So it's, yeah, it's this. Has anyone challenged that? Has there been um, work to challenge that in the public uh, policy space? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I think maybe um, I'm, I'm calling to mind Dorinda Bordley, who you probably know. Um, and I think she was very active in uh, Louisiana. I think Louisiana passed legislation that it won't allow women to be paid for their eggs or for their time in trouble. Um, but I'm, I'm, That would definitely disincentivize any uh, woman from even wanting to do that. Um, what is the, uh, what's the frequency that this is happening? At what frequency is ignorance? When you don't track something. It's not even tracked. You know, when something doesn't, you don't count things that don't count. And these women don't count. So we don't count them. We don't know. You know, the best you can get is CDC data that has an annual report on assisted reproductive technologies in America. And the best you can get is how many IVF cycles were performed, frozen embryos, fresh embryos. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell you who these women are. Or how many times is it, is it one woman in America who's helping give her eggs so that you know millions of embryos are made, or is it a million women in America? There's no meaning to these these figures. You know, the American Society for uh, Reproductive Medicine (ASRM), which is the professional, you know, organization for fertility medicine. You know, they, the best they give us is guidelines, and the guidelines say a woman should not sell her eggs, you know, provide her eggs more than six times. There's no data that justifies that. You know, the the reason for six is that they just don't want, you know, 500 children out there all from the same, you know, kind of mother. But it's not based on any kind of scientific data that if you, and, and the women in exploitation, I remind people when you watch the film, this is the first time they ever did this. So it wasn't that they had to do it six times to get cancer or lose their own fertility or have a stroke. This was the first time they did this. I want to get into sperm donation, as they call it, and IVF and surrogacy. But before that, the underlying principle uh, that I think the, the whole fertility industry is built on is the idea that we're owed or we have the right to pursue a child at pretty much any cost, provided we can afford it. And what is, what's your take on that? Because in the pro-life movement, obviously, we highly value children. They're human beings. They have equal rights to us, and we want to protect them. Adults should sacrifice for children. Big fertility is really focused on the adult or the couple wants a child, and so they'll go through many measures and great expense to pursue a child. What's your take on that? Yeah, I agree. I don't think anybody has a right to a child. I certainly don't agree anybody has a right to another person's body in order to have a child. So the whole area of third-party conception using egg and or sperm vendors, um, surrogate wombs, um, you know, I strongly op oppose that. Meaning um, the adult doesn't have the right to another adult's body. Obviously, yeah. if you're the child in the womb, yeah. this is your parent. You have the right to that, that, that nourishment. But I don't have yeah. the right to someone else's egg or sperm or yeah. children myself as an adult. Exactly. And so my husband and I, we have four children. Those are our children. We have a right to those children. They came out of our bodies. I gave birth to them. Those are our children. But I don't have a right to go to, um, you know, if I had a sister and say, will you give me her, your eggs or a girlfriend who, will you carry my ba my baby you know, to term for me because I can't. And we don't have a right. And we, you know, I, I don't think we have a right to ask um, insurance companies or, or tax dollars to provide for these rights. Which, which there's a lot of debate about, you know, well, we have to give all these people who don't even have an underlying infertility, single people, same-sex couples. You, I'm sorry, you don't have a right um, to, to have a child. But I oppose this for heterosexual couples as well. I mean, Mitt Romney has grandsons through gestational surrogacy, three of them. The response, obviously, from those that support uh, these assisted reproductive te technologies would be, well, we may not have a right per se. Obviously, we need the consent of this other person, but it's this beautiful thing because other people are consenting to help us grow our family. So as you said earlier, the marketing looks very slick for uh, targeting potential you know, women who could be egg donors. What's your take on that? You know, Because I agree with you. I think most people would say, yes, no one has the right to take somebody else's eggs or sperm without their consent or make them gestate their child without their consent. But let's say they're they're all consenting. 
all these adults are making all these economic agreements with each other. Um, why, why is that wrong? Well, the child isn't consenting. The, you know, the child isn't even often considered other than I want a child. You know, that's the consideration of that. Um, you know, we know now because we've been doing assisted reproductive technologies long enough that we have, we're starting to get good sample sizes and data. And children are at risk of certain kinds of health complications by the nature of how they were created, you know, in a Petri dish in the laboratory. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work in the space of adoption so that adoptions now are overwhelmingly open and children who have been adopted have the right to know who their biological birth mother, biological parents are. Um, siblings have a right to have um, access to medical information that might be really important to know if you have a medical history and you kind of go, well, I don't know who my, my biological parents are. I don't, that's just like big, a big blank state slate. And we've done a lot of really good work in acknowledging that right to adopted children but we've just totally ignored it as it relates to children that are born through egg and sperm donation and surrogate mothers. You know, birth certificates do not list who the birth mother, the surrogate mother might have been or the egg donor. So even if these children are told, you know, by the people who raised them, the commissioning parents, the intended parents, if, you know, they're told that they were conceived through egg or sperm donation or surrogacy, um, if the parents don't know who those people are, the child is left wondering you know, we now have 23andMe and there's the donor sibling registry and all these people are, you know, pooling data and data mining to try to find siblings, half siblings, grandparents, biological uh, parents and stuff. So the, the rights of the child are just totally ignored. Um, again, the child does not consent. And we're, we're just now realizing, too, that there are, you know, serious health concerns that these children, you know, heart disease, cancers, um, but we don't yet know why is that. You know, what, why is it? Is it because of the technique? You know, there's a, one procedure, it's called ICSI, um, intracytoplasmic transfers, where they actually take the sperm. And you'll, a lot of times you'll see it in scientific journals, the image, you'll see the egg, you'll see this needle coming in, and that's ICSI. They're actually breaking the barrier of the egg to shoot the sperm in. Um, and we've learned now that that's a really damaging technique. Um, but we did it because it's expedient, right? I mean, and it's controlled. But, you know, normally, if you look at an egg and natural conception, you know, all these sperm, and there's one that knows, we don't know how, but that, that's their egg. You know, and you'll see it sort of burrow in and burrow in, and then the conception happens. But when you start manufacturing and manipulating at this kind of a level, uh, when, you, when you do all the genetic testing and you've got like an eight-cell embryo and you, you take one cell out, you know, is, is that the problem? Because you have to imagine if it's so tiny of an, an embryo that it only has a few cells and you remove one, it's, like, it's kind of like baking a cake and forgetting the eggs, you know, and then you don't have a cake. You know, is that something that's causing the problem? Is it because we have couples with underlying fertility problems that nor normally Mother Nature, evolution, whatever you believe, this couple wouldn't normally have been able to produce, but we, we've kicked the can down the road and said, we're going to ignore that and we're going to force reproduction. Is that going on? We don't know. All we know now is we've been doing this long enough and we have enough children, large enough sample size over time that we're seeing some health complications. And those issues are just being put on children to just suck it up and be fine. Like the Hollywood movie, the kids are all right because they were wanted and they were loved. Have you heard the statistic? I, I'm sure you, you do work on this, but a million frozen embryos there's a million embryos in deep freeze in the United States. Do you think that's accurate? I think it's accurate, absolutely. There's a million plus in the United States and there's over two million in the United Kingdom. Because if you think of the United Kingdom, that's where we got the first test tube baby, Louise Brown. So in England, they were doing this a lot longer than here in the United two States. Two million babies in deep freeze in the United in, in Yeah, so. Uh, Do we know globally? Do you have any sense? I don't, I don't know, I don't know. So what happens to so children in deep freeze, it can be because they are children that the families are waiting to give them a chance to be born eventually, meaning the, the sibling was implanted and the, the, the family had that baby and then they're waiting to see if they'll have another one. Or they might be just on ice indefinitely, forgotten about, or they might be donated to research. Walk us through what's happening or what could happen to these million children in deep freeze. First, um, 
and it, again, this was my deep dive. Why do we have a half a million at the time Bush was president? IVF has a high failure rate. So, and it's very expensive, right? You know, this is not technology that's available to people who have no insurance or no finances. So we make a lot of embryos knowing that a lot of them are gonna die along the way. So I often, when I speak to pro-life groups, I will say, don't kid yourself, IVF is not pro-life because we are intentionally creating all these embryos knowing that maybe, maybe we'll get a baby at the end of the, the journey. Um, so we make a lot of embryos and it's quality control. So are these good eggs? Are these, is this good sperm? Are these healthy embryos? We're gonna implant the healthy ones, so the best ones first, and we'll put the other ones in the freezer. So if, if and when this pregnancy doesn't take, um, we can go back and you don't have to take all the drugs and go for this procedure again. We'll just have all these extra embryos. Then, you know, so say the couple wants two children and they have their two children, but they've got 20 embryos. They just pay the storage fee. And so couples can decide to leave them frozen indefinitely. And we know that happens a lot because people feel guilty. Like I made them because I, I wanted children and I don't really feel like I wanted to give them away for embryo adoption. I, I don't necessarily feel okay giving them to scientific research so that they can destroy them. You know, and, and I don't want any more children. We've had the children we want. We don't want more children. So we're just gonna let them stay and just keep paying the, the annual fee. I remember Lisa Mundy during the, the big Bush era debates, I wrote a great article in Mother Joan called Souls on Ice. I think there's an, a Catholic en encyclical too that I quoted in one article I wrote on the absurd fate of the frozen embryo. They're just in limbo. So, you know, those are sort of the options. You know, you can just, or, or you can let them die. You can just instruct the agency that you're no longer gonna uh, pay the storage fee and you don't want, you don't see them going, you know, for embryo adoption. You don't want them to just be destroyed. It's undignified. I mean, we had a couple last year that gave birth to an embryo that was created before the couple had even been born. I mean, just think about that. And you think about raising that child and sort of telling them their story. Well, your family really wanted children, but then they had their children and they didn't want any more. So they just left, left you. And then they said you could be adopted and so we adopted. I mean, I just can't imagine telling a child that that's their story of how they came into being. And then the child knows I've got parents out there. I've got siblings out there. They didn't want me. That is a controversy right now, a debate in the Catholic world among bioethicists and among other people of goodwill. What is the ethical response to this crisis that we have engineered? where we have these, as you say, souls on ice, and uh, you know that you can do heinous things with them by experimenting on them and killing them that way, or they're just indefinitely waiting, or they're brought into life at high risk. Many of them are di die in the process of implantation. So what's the percentage rate, by the way, for our listeners? What is the, what is the risk of death for an embryo going through the IVF process and being carried? I, I can't give a percentage because there's so many variables. You know, are, are you dealing with a, a, a couple that has, you know, good quality eggs and sperm or, or they already have a problem with, you know, having, you know, good quality eggs? You know, so a lot of it's just going to be like, you know, what the ingredients are, if you will, that you're working with. Um, we just know it's high. It's high. That's because, you know, the data just shows that we, we produce a lot of eggs. We make a lot of embryos because we know a lot will be you know, lost along the way. So, but you know, you have to ask yourself, at, you know, at what percentage are you comfortable with still pursuing this? You know, are you really comfortable? Even if I said it's a 10% chance, are you comfortable with that? I will. Well, it, it's so sad because you look in like, you know, chat rooms on Facebook or groups about IVF parents or, you know, Instagram accounts about IVF celebrating IVF. And, you know, obviously children who are born from IVF they are just as valuable and just as precious. And I believe God has a purpose for them just as much as any other child. What is the question here is the choices that adults are making. Yes. Uh, we are forcing a certain um, approach to reproduction that's not natural and that is fraught and filled with ethical problems as we're, as we're describing. But when you look in these sort of Instagram accounts or these chat rooms, you see them talking, you know, frequent conversations about this one failed. 
you know, you know, implant, they, there's certain names that are given, like dehumanizing names, quite frankly, you know, embryo one failed or this trans, I think it's this trans transfer. transfer, excuse me, transfer failed. We've got two more to transfer. So it's just like, get them off the conveyor belt. Yeah. And obviously this is great um, difficulty for the woman to do the transfer. Transfers are not this pleasant experience as an unnatural experience. And so it's like, well, okay, we transferred three and none of it worked. Okay, we're, we're gonna go through the rounds and do it again. Cause some parents, you know, try to approach it maybe more ethically in their mind. We're gonna not make as many embryos. We're gonna try to transfer them all, but knowing that many of them will die during transfer. Yes. And so it's creating life to give them a high risk from the earliest stages of death. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of people that try to, you know, do a little wiggling and a little maneuver, maneuvering just to sort of justify that they want to do that. And none of what I'm saying is means I'm unsympathetic to people who are struggling with infertility. Uh, you know, I 100 percent get that. Um, I, I 100 percent get the sadness and the grief that comes, the longing the, you know, the wanting, you know, growing up and wanting to be a mother or a father and, you know, to raise a family. And, and that's just doesn't seem to be in the cards for your future. I, I understand all that. But still, it gets back to just because you can do this, should you really? And you're there's to me, there's um, there's the super highway that big fertility puts you on. You know, one that's we just put women way too fast. You know, you try two months, you didn't get pregnant. Oh, go see the fertility doctor. There's this we just it instantly want to move people over there. And then there's so many women that have described it to me that there's just no exit ramps. You get on that highway and it fails and they say, well, we're do going to do it again. And we're going to do d these kind of drugs. And, uh, and, and, you know, and you kind of go with these people at some point, they spent thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, the women, their health is wrecked because they've been taking these powerful t fer fertility drugs. Um, and you, you grieve for these women because don't they deserve better? As women, you know, and there's, um, there's, you know, there's the whole movement of NAPA technology and the, the the less is better approach. And let's really try to understand what's going on with women's bodies and men's bodies too. Men struggle with infertility equally in amounts as same as, as women do. But, you know, in the olden days, you know, of 20, 30 years ago, society sort of just got, got on knowing that there was couples that for whatever reason, we're childless and you know, we didn't condemn them. We didn't judge them. You know, we grieved with them if they were childless and didn't want to be. Um, but, you know, I think we're at a, a, a stage where we think it's our right. And we've got this new modern technology and I've got the means, I've got the financial means, and I'm, I'm just going to do whatever I can to get a baby. And we sometimes we don't think clearly. There was something you said as well, meaning as many women or couples, they feel, well, now's the time. To have a baby they try for two months and you know the, the doctor the fertility specialist maybe they visit if they you know didn't succeed after a short period of time put them on the big fertility ramp i do think that's an interesting uh problem we face and i would argue it's a modern one that in the mindset of we're old children that we delay children you know many married couples even christians they delay children for years and years i'm gonna wait travel have fun have a successful career whatever, wait until I'm in my 30s, if they got married in their 20s, let's say, then I'm gonna have children. Okay, they stopped contracepting, they expect the child to come. Child doesn't come. Uh, then they start you know, being tempted to pursue big fertility. Um, or they have one child and then they're like, again, contracepting and then stop contracepting and expect the child to come. Do you think that that mindset of expecting the child to come on our timeline, when I argue children are a miraculous gift, they're not owed. Do you think that that's underlying the big fertility industry's success right now? I, I think so. I think they play on um, our sense of um, urgency and desperation. And, you know, we're kind of instantly satisfied people these days. You know, we want it now. We want it when, when we want it on our terms. I mean, the whole just movement in, um, you know, uh, sex selection idea. It's not even, I want a baby. I want a particular kind of baby. You know, the whole genetic testing, all the add-ons that people that enter into the big fertility industrial complex, you know, there are all these add-ons that you can, yes, I want to get a test to see what the baby has or doesn't have. And, um, you know, so we're not satisfied uh, with just the baby who comes from, you know, the loving union of a, of a, a man and his wife, a woman and her husband. Another ethical problem is what you were saying with the designer babies, you know, certain genetic 
perfection that they're looking for if there's a genetic issue, if they've already gone through the process of transplanting and there's multiple embryos that have taken and transplanted, or they missed something and the child has some defect that they don't like. Um, you know, you do see in women who find out, first, there's way too much prenatal uh, PGD, pre-implantation genetic testing. But for the women who didn't opt for that or weren't offered it or didn't choose it for whatever reason, you know, there, there is ways to find out when, once a woman's pregnant, you know, what kind of baby she's carrying. Is she carrying a healthy baby? Is she carrying a boy baby? Is she wanted a girl baby? Is she carrying triplets, but she doesn't want triplets? You know, so there, because we, our children are now products, we just, we just say, well, doctor, take that one away or get rid of that one. Because, you know, my husband and I have two little girls and we really just wanted a boy. Um, and so we don't want another little girl. And you've seen this happen? I haven't personally seen it happen because I mostly deal with surrogates. Mm -hmm. And when it happens in the surrogacy space, which it happens, you know, quite commonly in the surrogacy space, I don't normally, because of the work I do in assisted reproductive technology in third party conception, I don't typically get women contacting me about their own pregnancy and, and what they're doing. So I'm thinking of an article I read. I, I don't remember the news, uh, you know, the, the news group. It might have been a popular blog, but it was a woman telling her story about IVF and having implanted three embryos, being told that they wouldn't all catch, so to speak, and they did. And as the pregnancy continued and the babies developed, it was too much in her body, she said. So these three little children whose lives that she had created um, in a petri dish, you know, through paying the scientists or whatever, now she was going to select for, I think it was a, an abortion at maybe it was 17 or 18 weeks, um, ending the life of one of these three because they, they hadn't died already, you know, in, in a first trimester miscarriage. So you see these heinous, cr heinous things, and but there's no law preventing that from happening. It was all set up to happen and it was perfectly legal for her to do that. And it, and it puts um, her and the other uh, fetuses, embryos, whatever the stages of the pregnancy at risk. Um, and you, I think of, you know, one of the cases I was really involved in when it broke was the Octu mom case. And, you know, we're just, we're just a, a, a kind of a kooky culture these days with our thinking, which isn't really coherent. And Octu mom, I think they actually transferred five embryos into her because she wanted all the ones that were frozen implanted. And then, of course, as embryos do, they naturally twinned, which is how she ended up with eight. And if you'll remember, there was a lot of outrage because she didn't terminate, she didn't reduce, um, and she gave birth to eight. So whether we're, we're seeing women who are choosing to reduce down a pregnancy, um, putting that whole entire, uh, the whole entire pregnancy can be put at risk, or you see a woman who's basically putting the lives of eight unborn children at huge risk because they could be born terribly terribly premature and, and, and not survive, um, you know, we just, but when you see this is something I can just order and get what I want, you know, like going to the, you know, the shopping mall and, and looking at new sunglasses or something, and I want these kind and oh, I, I take them home and I change my mind, I return them and get a different kind. And we treat children like that. You know, the whole designer baby um, thinking is alive and well. I have the money to buy and the technology will allow me to do this. So I want to get to surrogacy. We're going to end with that because you've done a ton of work on that and it's incredibly important. But in before that, there's a, two other things. Um, sperm donors, I'm going to talk about that. And also egg freezing, because one of the things that a lot of big corporations are even offering their female employees, and I think to encourage them to stay working during their you know peak fertility years, their 20s, their early 30s, is egg freezing, saying it's totally fine. You can wait till your late 30s or even your early 40s to have a child. And, you know, the entertainer Keisha, as an example, recently shared online about how she had a near death experience after her egg freezing process. Share, share more about your work on that. I often tell young men that sperm donation isn't bad for your health like it is for an egg donor because you don't take drugs. It might just be bad for your soul. <laughs> um, I visited a fertility clinic, you know, nearby where I live once kind of, you know, incognito. I went with a friend of mine who's an OBGYN and she, she practices at the community and we just wanted a tour of the facility. And they took us into the sperm donor room, which is, you know, big, easy back chairs, flat screen TVs, pornography galore. And I just thought to myself, I don't think I could go to work here every day 
you know, helping people have babies is sort of knowing what, you know, men are going like in. Like entering into <laughs> a ring of hell. It's like, yeah, yeah. And you think again, back to the child, this is the way the child was sort of the beginning of their story is, you know. Well, it's that children deserve to be conceived in love between their married parents who yeah. sacrifice for each other and that child instead of being conceived in a fertility clinic at high risk to them where their dad is, you know, jerking off to some porn star. Yeah. And this isn't like polite conversation that you have when you're at a cocktail party, but these are the kind of things you have to talk about if you're going to say, yeah, it's okay for a man to be a, an anonymous sperm donor or, or, or even not an anonymous guy. And, you know, we have how many stories of some guy who's, you know, conceived 500 children and he's, you know, like the stud star donor that people want. Um, you know, Colorado has just become the first state in the United States where the governor signed a law that goes into effect, I believe, next year, which makes sperm and egg donation no longer anonymous. So it will finally give at least the rights to the children, you know, to to know and be known by who that person is. And the, the clinics have to keep records so that when the child grows up and wants to find out who the sperm donor dad was, they can't say, well, we've destroyed the records. They have. I mean, but what kind of dad or mom yeah. is going through these processes, the father masturbating, the woman putting great risk to her body, selling their body parts for these children and now these children are going to find out down the line, this was my parent. And again, I, I don't mean here to lack empathy or understanding for all of the, the grief and the, and the pain around IVF and fertility treatments. But I think men and women need to take some responsibility here, yeah. including the donors. Absolutely. And we now have like it's, uh, several stories have been broken about you know, somebody's deceased and they use the sperm of the deceased person. There was a celebrity in Spain recently that just hired a surrogate and used her dead son's sperm because she wanted to be a grandmother. Again, it's me. Extreme what do I want? narcissism and yeah. selfishness. Yes. So that, those are sort of my uh, thoughts on, and again, they, these are your children. You know, don't be a deadbeat dad. Uh, you know, and there's, you know, plenty of stories. Uh, Netflix had a great uh, documentary, I think last year it came out, on basically a fertility doctor in uh, Indiana who for decades was using his own sperm not even telling the women, these women thought he was using their husband's sperm um, to, you know, get them pregnant. And he was using his own sperm, but it was, it only got exposed because of DNA testing. And, you know, kids were kind of going, huh, this isn't my father. And all, these women were, of course, shocked because all along, and the, and the poor husbands, all along, they thought they were raising their, you know, genetic biological child. Um, so there's plenty of, you know, ickiness to go all, all around, I think, to get people to s stop doing this. There's also the question of if you're dealing with an egg donor um, or in particularly a sperm donor, because it's just the, the, the sheer you know load of that. There's so many sperm that can be donated from one man in just one sitting. Uh, I have heard also that the problem is you have you know hundreds of potential offspring out in the world. They're you know, maybe end up communicating or uh, populating together and incest can happen without folks realizing. Uh, biological siblings or cousins or um, you can somehow get together, maybe even get married and not know that they're biologically from the same parent. Yeah. Has that happened? That has happened. I remember a couple in the United Kingdom, they were actually dating. So at least they sort of, found, they discovered it before, you know, they actually got married. But yeah, it, it happens. And I don't know at, at what frequency. And I think that will be one of those, again, dirty little secrets that will come out as more and more people, you know, opt to do genetic testing, opt to start their, you know, their genealogy searches and find out. And there's just a lot of people that just get bombs dropped in their lap, you know, where all along they just thought, and you know, we did a film called Anonymous Father's Day, and we interviewed a bunch of, you know, young people that were created through anonymous sperm donation. And part of that film sort of unpacks the different ways uh, children found out. Um, you know, some found out really early in life because their parents had already adopted an international child. So they're a blonde haired, blue eyed, you know, child with an Asian sibling. You know, so that was somebody who knew early on. There was another woman who found out late in life because her father was very ill. And she's a mom of five little kids at the time. And she's like, Mom, I hope I don't get what dad has. And her mom just said, oh, something we've never told you. I'll tell you now. Your dad's not your biological father. And that her whole world just, you know, unraveled and, and shook. So, um, you know, who, who are the innocents here? It's often the children. Do we know how many children there are walking the world today who are conceived, uh, created via IVF? In California right now, just when we're sitting here and kids are being born, you know, through egg sperm surrogacy and 
the, you know, their birth certificate in California might say two dads. There was a there was a case in San Diego. I'm sure you saw this recently where three men, a throuple, um, who wanted to, you know, demanded to be all listed on this child's birth certificate. This child had no would have no uh, knowledge or have no record of his or her mother, but would be, uh, you know, their, their, his parents would insist that he has three dads instead and that this was somehow natural and good for him. And that was what would be listed on his birth certificate. And I think a San Diego judge um, gave permission for that to be done. I'm, I'm not surprised. I think I, I remember that story. And I, I think that is the ruling of the judge because we want to keep the adults happy. It's all about the adults. It's not about the children. And when you think of, in the case of gay men, um, you know, they obviously had to use a surrogate womb. They for sure used an egg donor. So they used two separate women um, because they don't want the woman who's giving birth to be the genetic mother because they want her to have no rights, right, to this child. The egg donor is probably some girl on a university campus that's thinking she's helping, you know, a heterosexual couple who's been struggling with infertility, has no clue that she's, you know, colluded in and part of, you know, creating a child that now has legally three fathers. Um, because we're not telling women your eggs are going here. You're just selling them to somebody who's going to pick you out of a catalog with no regard to the child, no regard. So uh, now let's get into surrogacy. We've tiptoed around it a little bit, um, talking about all of these other related issues. But surrogacy has, in addition to the harms of IVF, um, the harms of uh, sperm donation, the harms of egg donation, it has a whole host of its unique problems. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, there's just a couple of definitions. There's a word, a word called altruistic surrogacy, which I hate. Um, it's not altruistic, meaning the woman's not being paid. She's just a good woman who's helping somebody have a baby for them. Often you see that if a sister's helping a sister, she's not asking her sister to help her. Then there's overwhelmingly what we do now is gestational surrogacy. So the, the surrogate mother is not carrying a child that's genetically related to her. It could be from an infertile heterosexual couple, could be from a single person that's just hired her to have a baby for them, or it could be from a same-sex couple, which means they're using the egg donor because there's no woman in the equation that's providing her genetic material. Um, then there's commercial surrogacy too, which is, you know, meaning she's being paid, which legally most states allow women to be paid. Uh, we've, we've known the, the literature for quite some time now that surrogate pregnancy is much higher risk than a woman's natural um, pregnancy. And we're finding out why that is. And it's, over, it's part of it is because she's carrying a form, foreign embryo. You know, back to organ donation. I can't just give you my kidney if you needed one because I love you and I want you to have my kidney. We'd have to go through all kinds of testing to make sure that we're compatible and that you're going to be able to, you know, accept that um, kidney and it won't be rejected. Um, and it immediately makes, it makes such sense, right? You just put a foreign embryo in a woman's body and her body immediately has an uh, kind of like an inflammatory reaction, a response. It's like when you get a splinter in your finger, it gets red and it gets swollen and it gets infected. Your body is saying, this is foreign, get it out. Um, so, you know, there's those kinds of risks that we see in the pregnancy from the get-go. And those risks translate to like higher rates of preeclampsia, higher rates of um, mist, uh, maternal gestational diabetes, um, higher rates of preterm birth. Right? If you're already in a high risk, you know, pregnancy that's struggling, and then because of the cost um, and because of the demands of you know paying you, you know, why shouldn't I have you give me twins? Because I get two babies for this big chunk of money I have to pay you. So that puts the woman and of course the children um, that she's carrying or the child that she's carrying in a high risk situation. Now, what we did, my colleague and I, uh, we actually got through peer reviewed our own literature. Um, published because what's out there now is just looking at, let's just look at 50 women who were surrogates and look at what the complications were. We, our peer-reviewed study, asked the women the same exact questions for when they had their own pregnancies with their own children and they kept them. And then the same questions for when they were a gestational surrogate. And I hate that word, gestational surrogate, birth mother, surrogate mothers, women, mothers. Um, and we show that those high risks stay um, and what we found, too, is they had higher rates of postpartum depression. So when we said, did you, when you went home with your newborn, did you have postpartum depression? No, 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 no. When you went home as a surrogate mother with empty heart, arms, breasts filling up with milk, did you have? Yes, we had postpartum depression. 
we found that in their surrogate pregnancies, they had a lot more chronic illness, you know, migraines, continued high blood pressure problems, things like that. Um, and we did the demographics financially because we're not poor like India or Thailand or Africa. You see these poorer countries where surrogacy might be practiced. They were still in the lower tax tiers financially um, based on like the, the federal government sort of income tax tier. Overwhelmingly, the women were either partnered or married to men that had high school education or GED. Um, the women were more educated. But what if we were going to go back and repeat the study, we didn't ask at what point did they go back and, and pursue um, a college degree or an advanced degree? Because it might have been tied to when they made the money from surrogacy. Um, and that was, it was something, you know, when you're in the middle of a study, you, you start seeing something, you're like, ah, oh, I wish we had gotten that question approved through the peer review process. Because it was clear just in speaking with a lot of the women that they had gone back to school. And we did ask what they needed the money for. And overwhelmingly, they said to pay bills and get out of debt. Yeah, these aren't wealthy women doing this. What they're doing it for, typically wealthy women or men, same-sex yeah. couples, men, two gay dudes, yeah. men. Um, in the case of Khloe Kardashian recently, I'm sure you saw this clip where she was expressing uh, a kind of regret or uh, emotional disturbance anyways about the surrogate that she had, surrogacy pregnancy she had purchased and saying it just felt weird for her to take this child off of the chest of the mother that only mother that he or she had ever known and just hold this, you know, she'd been living her life doing her modeling, doing her thing. And now she's holding this brand new baby. What, what did you think about that? It, it breaks my heart because we know, we, we know that maternal child bonding is real. We know it's good. We know it's important. We, in, you know, in my previous life in the hospital setting, we would, you know, there's no visiting hours for moms and dads in a hospital because we want moms and dads with their child, babies, whatever, as much as they can possibly be there. But in surrogates, we kind of go, that doesn't matter. You know, and, you know, people will get outraged if, you know, uh, Anderson Cooper announces he's having another baby through surrogacy or Andy Cohen. But I was outraged when, you know, the, the conservative darling, um, Dave Rubin, uh, announced that he and his husband had used the same egg donor but separate surrogates because they wanted their children to have the same genetic mother, but separate surrogates. And, you know, I, I saw these politically conservative people congratulating him. And I'm like, wait a minute, you can't be mad when you see somebody who you don't like that's, you know, not your political, your teen or who's a gay person and be outraged by that and then and congratulate them. And I, I sat through, I struggled watching like Jordan Peterson interview Ruben and I was just like, ask him this question, ask him this question, you know, and it was just, you know, we, we have the means, we have the team, we have helpers, these children will have everything that they need. No, they won't have a mother. I saw Jordan Peterson, uh, Dave Rubin gave him credit, he said, for going and pursuing having children because Jordan Peterson said, it will make you a better person, Dave. And I remember just being also grieved when I saw that and upset for those children because it's all about the adult. It's all about children make you better. They will fulfill you as opposed to what's best for the children. I mean, I think Jordan Peterson has done so much good work, but it was so sad and contradictory to see him encouraging, you know, according to Dave Rubin, encouraging Dave to have children, telling him it would make him a better man, a better person, um, but to have children at what cost, you know, at a cost to the, the child. So an adult centric view of it so fulfills you when it has such risk for the child. Yeah, I found myself very, um, almost like wanting to yell at the screen when, <laughs> Dr. Peterson, no. But yeah, it's, we don't want, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't want to say, and of course, I'm with you. These children are wonderful. There's to no fault of their own, you know, that they, they are here. And I, and I hope and pray that they do well and that they thrive. Um, but, you know, it, we just can't, we just can't ignore what we what we know and we've known for so long. Children love their mother. They want their mother. When I see these babies, you know, we say wet wet from the womb being plot put on the chest of strangers, whether that be a female stranger or whether it be a, a, a gay man, you know, that child does not that's for that's for that adult. The adult is doing it for them, not for the benefit of the of the child. I interviewed one surrogate once. She was a surrogate for uh, 
a husband and wife. Um, it was so it was the husband and wife's biological child. But the wife actually was a, a, a very trained physician in in the space of neurology and neuroscience. So she had the surrogate come and live with her for two weeks and to uh, nurse the baby and then hand the baby right to her so that, you know, the surrogate would feed the baby and then pass it to the, the biological mother because that physician knew the, the brain trauma of separating that, that child. And so she was trying to mitigate that trauma um, by manufacturing this situation where this woman nurses the baby and then hands it immediately. And now you're thinking, is the baby making that connection? And then, and then what happens after two weeks? Then all of a sudden, this other person's just holding them, and that person that was nursing them is is gone. I do think it's important here to take a quick note to look at a pause to look at adoption because, you know, some folks listening would say, "Hey, this sounds just like anti-adoption rhetoric." You could apply what you're saying about surrogacy to adoption, and so how do you see the differences, ethically speaking, between surrogacy and adoption? I, well, I know you've had Katie Faust on your on your show, and you know she's just done a, a great job there. And we know that there's the orphan will always be with us. You know, we're never going to live in a world where there are not children. I mean, there's children that are orphaned because of war, you know, because of you know of disease and, and pandemics that just come in and uh, obliterate a, a culture. So we will always have to adopt, have uh, children that need to be placed in homes. Um, and so, you know, the loving home, the, the, the family that will a- adopt that child, you know, it, I think Katie uses it that the wound is already there, but how do we, you know, take care of this child who we can't just leave them in institutions and orphanages? That's not humane. But in third party conception, um, you know, you're, you're on purpose intentionally creating that wound, creating that mother, uh, mother child bond. Um, you know, w- one of my books is called Broken Bonds. Surrogate mothers speak out, um, and you you can't just wish that away because adults want something. And in adoption, you're trying to, as you said, mitigate the wound or heal the heal the wound by taking a child who doesn't have parents, who's already with us, and giving that child a family. So it's a child centric as opposed to assisted reproductive technologies that's creating a child in a petri dish and maybe using a surrogate or using definitely using IVF. And in that case, it's the adult wants a child. Yeah. And so the adult is going out there and creating a new life for their own satisfaction as opposed to there is a new life here that needs a loving family. And that's why we can say adoption is so beautiful, can be so beautiful, although it does have its hardships, too. It's, I think, wrong, even in the pro-life movement, for us to pretend that, you know, adoption doesn't have, there aren't struggles for some adoptees. But overall, it's this very beautiful thing where you're giving children a chance at life versus I'm going to create this life with all of the ethical problems and all of the risk to this little life. Yeah, and our policies and laws have acknowledged that trauma in the lives of ad- adoptees, which is why overwhelmingly we do not have sealed records. We do not you know, destroy records so that child children cannot grow up and find out any of their story and who they're... We try to do a, a open adoption where, you know, I have friends that have adopted many, many children and they have an open, ongoing relationship with their children the, the ch- these children's birth moms, where you know birth mo- moms are free to come and go and come and visit, and so you know because we've understood that, but in the space of third party reproduction, we're just ignoring that trauma and not learning our, our, our lessons at all. When you look at what a child deserves, you know the child's uh, a child centric or child rights position. I see from a natural perspective, they deserve to be conceived by two parents that love each other, conceived naturally by parents who are married and love each other. They deserve to be carried in the womb of their biological mother um, and loved in that in that process. And then they deserve to be in when it's possible, you know, obviously because of death or abuse or abandonment or other extreme situations. Sometimes it's not possible disease, but when possible to be raised by their biological parents and the biological parents empowered to raise them. Um, do you speak to that? I know that you talk a lot about what's best for the child, but how do you see the, the, the optimal situation for the child, the ideal that we should pursue as a society. I absolutely agree with that. I think, you know, that's the right, the right to the child to know, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child, to know and be known by their biological families. I think our policies need to be way more family friendly so that, you know, families can and can provide and raise their children in in a home with their loving mother, father, uh, you know, their their 
their parents. I mean, I, I worry that, you know, in, in today's America, we don't have a middle class where one one parent can stay home and raise the family if they so desire to do that. So you have you've created a system that requires people to be out working two jobs, sometimes, you know, husbands and wives working second jobs, you know, just to make ends meet. And then your know, children are being raised by, you know, government or programs or childcare situations. And, you know, we'll always need people to help. Um, but it's not the Hillary Clinton that takes a village, you know, or Joe Biden. It's we're every everybody's we're everybody's, you know, parent or they're all our children. Why are women being offered a Google to freeze and bank their eggs or Facebook or LinkedIn so that they can put off their child, you know, rearing till what they're 40? And that's a train wreck when you when you just look at the data of older women trying to conceive. Um, so we just need to be way more family friendly in in our policies, I think. One of the most um, extreme cases I've seen, but unfortunately it's not uncommon, was a story that you broke. And this is about, I think in a nutshell, encompasses all the different harms of surrogacy. And you just broke it recently. It's about a mother, um, a woman in California who was a surrogate for two gay men. Can you tell us about that story? Yeah, her, I, I know her aunt. She reached out to me um, for help. You know, a lot of times I get contact because help. Uh, she, her niece was doing her second surrogacy. Um, her first surrogacy she did for a, a, a couple that she gave birth to twins and loves helping. It's all the marketing, you know, be, be an angel, help somebody, loves helping. And so she signed up to do a second surrogacy um, for an, another gay couple in the, the Los Angeles area. And at 24 weeks, um, she went in for a routine, you know, physical exam and uh, a lump on her breast was detected. And then sure enough, it came back that it was cancerous. So at the very beginning, the, the therapy that she was being prescribed, she could keep the pregnancy and the treatment for the cancer would not be you know, harmful to the, the developing uh, baby. Um, but then when more tests came back, she had a different type of cancer that needed a whole different type of treatment that was not conducive to, to the you know, developing baby. Um, so at that point, the, you know, the couple told her that she needed to terminate the pregnancy. At 24 weeks. At 24 weeks. And they, she said, um, I don't want to do that. Um, would you be willing to let the baby be adopted? And they refused to uh, let the baby be adopted. And of course, the law sees them as the fathers. You know, the, the contract is signed in such a way that she has no, she has no maternal rights, you know. Um, and even the, her, her doctor said, I know a wonderful couple that would be happy to adopt this child, but they were adamant that they did not want the couple, um, they did not want the child to be adopted. Why? What was their reason? Uh, they didn't want their DNA out there. Disgusting. Yeah. It's, you know. Disgusting. Yeah. So they demanded that she kill the baby. Yeah. Yeah. They, and so she, she had to scramble because she was just trying to find a place that would allow her to actually deliver the child in hopes that. The child would survive. Um, in the story, uh, she tells me how she contacted uh, CPS because she thought, "Isn't this infanticide? You know, is it, you know they're basically saying I have to deliver this child and let it die." Um, CPS said, "Well, during because of the urgency of it, you need to get the the sheriffs involved." So she contacted local. You know, what if she had just said, "No, I'm not going to abort. I'm just going to let the pregnancy continue. Come make me." What, what would have happened? Well, her, her wrinkle was that she really wanted to start her cancer treatment because she's got four small children that she's the mother of. And so she was really in this, you know, kind of Solomon's choice of, you know, either, you know, the baby, I carry the pregnancy to term and then I might die. Um, but she was not being told that she could take the cancer therapy that was going to damage the baby. She didn't want to do that either. So that's, I think, you know, you don't want to put women in these kind of positions where she has to make this kind of a choice. Now, if this was her own child and she wasn't a surrogate, she could have gone to a hospital and delivered that child. By the time she actually finally did deliver, she was 25 weeks. And then the hospital staff could have intervened and done whatever the you know, emergency um, treatment therapy that was needed to sustain this baby's life. Um, but, you know, she, she couldn't even find a hospital that was willing to deliver hers. Because the two fathers, and I say fathers lightly, went as far as contacting hospital CEOs and said, we will sue you if you let that child be born there. So she finally was able to find a hospital that allowed her to labor and deliver that child. 
But when I asked her point blank about when that child came out of you, what happened in the delivery room as far as doctors and nurses providing any level of care, she said, I'm not comfortable talking about that. Do we know if it, he was a boy or if it was a girl? I, I believe it was a boy. A boy. I believe it was a boy. So well, she wouldn't tell you what happened to that little boy when he was born. But yeah, that tells me because if he had been born and he had already passed, I think that's, you know, while he was, he had passed. Yeah. But what probably happened is he was born alive and he was denied medical care and he was left to die. Or he was killed after birth, which is infanticide. But who's the wife? Who's the wiser? Who's regulating that? Who's monitoring that? Because her story has really kind of made it all the way to the Daily Mail in England. You know, there were people in that room that may come forward. I don't know. Um, you know, there were doctors, there were nurses, there was, you know, people in that room. She wasn't in a room by herself. So there was witnesses. Um, and, you know, we live in kind of a whistleblower era. So maybe somebody will come forward that this will say, you know, I can't sleep with myself. And as I, you know, talk about what I saw happen, I don't know. But the problem is, Jennifer, as you know, abortion is legal in the state of California. In cases provided, you have a doctor sign off through all nine months of pregnancy. Yeah. So you have this little boy who probably had siblings who probably are either dead or in deep freeze, brought into existence by these two men through a lot of money changing hands, carried all the way to 25 weeks old, already destined to not have a mother. And then they didn't like the fact that he would be born early and didn't want him to be adopted out. And so they ordered his death. And that's that's what that scene took place in that California hospital room and nobody intervened. And no, there's nothing that will stop the, these two awful human beings from doing it again, from hiring a surrogate and buying eggs from another egg donor. I mean, for all I know, they've already, you know, started a new contract. You know, who knows? What should be done legally to stop this? Well, I, you know, I run a Stop Surrogacy Now campaign. Uh, I, I, I put this as a human rights violation, the, the violation of the rights of a, a mother and a child. Uh, there's no way, I would say there's no way you can do surrogacy in a way that is ethically, morally permissible. No way. Uh, New York State, during the COVID pandemic, sneaked through in the wee hours of the night a, a law that legalized commercial gestational surrogacy in New York State. And if you read that bill, I think it's 60 something plus pages because they tried to regulate everything that could possibly go wrong. We've had two surrogate mothers in California die. You can't pass a law that says you know, you're, you're putting women in a high risk um, pregnancy situation. What are you going to do legislatively that will protect women from dying? Um, the two women that died, fortunately, the children that they were carrying didn't. But there was a surrogate mother in Boise, Idaho, who died. And the twins that she was carrying for a couple in Spain died. So there's three people that died. So to me, the only way is, is to ban it. To ban it. And also, I, I would say the message of, you know, if you're listening to this, if you're on the fence or you're, you're a woman who's thinking about surrogacy, women can take responsibility if we just stop being the market. Yeah. For whether it's gay men or infertile couples or whoever to say, we're not selling our bodies yeah. and we're not going to put children at risk this way no more. I mean, yes, I think there's victimization for the women to some degree. And, and if they're low socioeconomic status, you know, there's more of a temptation. But we can say no more. Yeah. We're not going to take part in this exploitative and unethical industry. I, I, I agree. You know, our hands off our, our ovaries campaign was that no. Women just say, no, I'm not selling my eggs. I'm not renting my body. And I also say that to people listening. If you're listening and you're struggling to conceive, please keep your hands off young women's bodies. Don't ask them. Don't you know put this risk onto them. Don't put this risk onto your, your unborn child, your child that you want to have. You know, get, Keep your hands off other people's bodies. Jennifer, your work is so such pioneering and important work. How can people learn more about it and find you, um, follow you in the future? Yeah, well, our website is www.cbc-network.org. We have a huge YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. All of our movies are free on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and, and you know put in the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network, you'll go uh, go to our channel. I'm pretty active on Twitter and Instagram. So if people want to follow me personally, they can they can do that. But it's been lovely to be with you. You're, you're just my hero. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Keep up the amazing work. And we look forward to following it and reporting at Live Action News on the amazing things that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.